Good morning. Welcome to Innovations in Surgery. I'm Dr. Phil Schauer here at the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. And on behalf of my colleagues, Dr. Adrian Park and Steve Wexner, I would like to give you a warm welcome. We always try to bring new and innovative technologies uh, to you, the practicing surgeon. And I think today you will um, uh, certainly be very happy with the presentation today on gastric balloons. Now, I'm very uh, happy to uh, reintroduce my colleague, Dr. John Rodriguez, who actually spoke last month at this conference. We're getting a mileage out of you, John. Uh, and John um, is an up-and-coming young surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic here in Cleveland, Ohio. He has a focus on uh, MIS for gut and bariatrics, and particularly endoscopy. And he's going to be talking, uh, giving us an update on um, gastric balloons, boom or bust. Let's hear about it. Okay, John, take it away. Thank you, Phil. Uh, thanks again for this great opportunity. And as you mentioned, we're going to talk about a very controversial topic in bariatrics today, which is uh, gastric balloons. Is it really a boom or is it a bust? So endoscopic bariatric therapy has been a big focus over the past few years for the bariatric community. And, and what we're really trying to do is expand the minimally invasive treatment of obesity and having a balanced risk and risk uh, profile. So balloons specifically are space-occupying devices that work by producing satiety in patients. Uh, Modern-day balloons are saline-filled, um, and they do have an acceptable safety profile according to the data that's out there. Looking back into the history of balloons a little bit, they actually started here in the United States back in the 1980s uh, with the introduction of the Garen Edwards balloon, which was really a, a small cylindrical air-filled balloon with, with a, a hole in the middle. And unfortunately, the results were pretty disappointing and the complication rates were pretty high, pretty much uh, due to deflation and migration. So the balloon was uh, discontinued in 1988. But in the middle of the hype of the, of the balloons in the 1980s, there was a, a significant workshop that happened in Florida um, where a, a group of experts met, um, and there was a mix of surgeons and gastroenterologists, and they tried to agree on what the design feature should be for balloons. And, Pretty much the agreement is that they should be made of high quality silicone, they should be filled with saline because they, they function in a more physiologic way. Um, they have to be spherical and, and have a smooth surface with a radiopaque marker. And the volume should really be no more than four to 500 cc. In terms of the indications, what they were looking at is super obese patients and using this as a bridge um, or patients with low BMI that were not suitable or not adequate candidates for bariatric surgery and also patients in the 40 to 50 range, but were not candidates because of uh, high risk medical conditions. Talking about modern day balloons, uh, there's pretty much two that I'm gonna mention, which is the uh, bioenteric centric gastric balloon, which was introduced in 1991. Um, you can see it here in the picture. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, commercialized in the US as the uh, Orbera balloon by Apollo Endosurgery, and, and the fill volume goes up to 700 cc's. And the newer balloon uh, that was introduced in 2007 by a startup company is a reshaped duo, uh, which is a dual balloon that has two lobes of 450 cc's each. So it can be filled up to about 900 cc's. Looking at the FDA approval uh, indications and contraindications from last year, what they're looking at is patients in the 30 to 40 range or adults who have failed medical weight loss and that these balloons should be placed in combination with diet and behavioral modification. Now, I think the contraindications are, are very interesting because they, they kind of contradict what a lot of us have in our minds as a potential uh, indication for, for these balloons. So a lot of logical contraindications like structural or post-surgical GI anatomy, and this can be hiatal hernias, prior gastrectomies, prior bariatric surgery, any evidence of inflammatory disease, uh, any condition leading to a high risk of GI bleeding, um, hepatic insufficiency or cirrhosis, uh, use of uh, anticoagulation or aspirin in patients who are pregnant or breastfeeding. So what happened in almost 30 years of history since we first started talking about balloons and now? Well, John, that's a great question. You know, we have an outstanding audience here, in particular our international sites who are on board. Because while it's not been available in the United States because of no FDA approval, it's been used in Europe quite a bit. So can we please go to um, our colleagues in Strasbourg, France at IRCAD? And I'd love to get their impression of what's been going on. And uh, I see uh, 
uh, two very distinguished gentlemen, uh, Bernard Del Magna and Dr. Vix. Uh, can you guys tell us um, uh, what's been happening, uh, Bernard, with the balloon in Europe over the past <coughs> decade while well, we uh, Americans have been asleep <coughs> and not doing these things? I feel. Um, yes, you're right. We, we used this balloon back in the early 90s, and uh, we looked at the outcome of this patient. Uh, I think it was uh, around 1,000 patients. And uh, unfortunately, on the long run, the response to this therapy was almost zero. So um, uh, initially, uh, when we, we used that, um, we didn't think about the bridge uh, before surgery, because you remember back in the early 90s, gastric bypass was not very common in laparoscopy. Uh, so probably the position of the balloon has changed now. Uh, and what we've learned is that is a, as a first treatment or definitive treatment doesn't work. Uh, we had some problems at the time. Uh, I remember one patient after anti-reflux surgery who just uh, ruptured the stomach. Uh, we had uh, bowel occlusion because the balloon deflates and migrates inside of the bowel, the small bowel. So we had quite a important problem. So that's why I would say that based on our experience, uh, to consider the balloon as a definitive treatment for obesity is, uh, is, a, is a dream. Uh, but uh, regarding the option of a bridge, preparing the patient for uh, laparoscopic surgery, that might be an option. So this is our experience from Belgium back in the early 90s. Great. Well, Dr. Rodriguez is going to update us on some of the data, but I'm curious, um, with the new balloons, the new construction, um, are these not better? Are these uh, lower risk? Are they more efficacious, uh, Bernard or Professor Vix? We have very, very... We have very few uh, clinical experience with the, the balloons. Uh, we use that for, in, a, in a few cases as a bridge before doing the, the surgery. The problem we had is the um, signaling of the, the, the wall of the stomach, and so we have to wait for one or two months for going back for doing something else. And in this time, the, pa the, the patient regained weight. And of course, we had also some uh, complications so <clears throat> we, we have to check what, what will be the, um, the outcome after removing the, the balloon and when we can perform the surgery. Uh, if the surgery can be performed uh, immediately, that can be a very good bridge for very obese patients and to decrease the um, difficulty of the, the operation. But here we have very few experience. At one hand, it's not reimbursed, and so it's uh, not a very big development like you in um, uh, South America <coughs> in, in France. So uh, but what about uh, as a primary procedure, Professor Vicks, uh, particularly in um, uh, the lower BMI? I think they're really pushing, the companies are really pushing this for the you know, BMI 30 or patients you wouldn't think of, a, uh, of an invasive bariatric operation. Does it have a role there? Can, can, that, that can be a, a rule there, but as I say, we have very few experience in, in France because the balloon is not reimbursed, especially for lower BMIs, and so we, we have very, very small experience in putting uh, balloons in place. The yeah. teams of uh, Brazil are more, uh, have bigger experience with that and very larger um, uh, facilities for putting the, the balloons in place. Yeah, what do you suppose is taking off in Brazil? I mean, after all, this uh, the price of the balloon is much lower than uh, a bariatric operation. I hear prices of something like 4,000, 5,000 US, which brings it into a consumer sort of realm. Um, so I'm just curious why it seems to be taken off in Brazil, for example. And by the way, the lap bands never took off in Brazil. So why is the balloon thriving there, but not in the heart of Europe. Professor Vix or Bernard, any comments? Be because to today there is, uh, there is no uh, uh, French um, um, social insurance approval for placing uh, the, the bands, and so the patient has to pay all the, the operation, the procedure, and so on, the balloon. Uh, for the bariatric surgery, all the things are totally reimbursed. So. <laughs> Uh, the, the, it's very easy to understand that uh, the, the balloon is not increasing in, in, in France and uh, that we are doing more and more surgery and uh, so things can change if we are able to uh, show that there is an effect 
on uh, obesity and uh, metabolic uh, disease for lower BMIs uh, after some studies for putting some balloons and having good results. Very good. Dr. Damani, I'll ask you the same question. Are you not surprised with the price dropping so much? You know, three or four thousand dollars, that's affordable. The consumer should be able to afford this balloon and there's so many millions of people with a BMI of 30 that want to lose weight. Uh, Dr. Delmagna? We were just discussing about the price of this balloon. It's, it's quite impressive. Uh, so the, the, the risk benefit, no, the cost benefit is uh, questionable because, uh, again, coming back to our experience, uh, we cannot consider that as a definitive treatment for sure. Uh, the only question that I, uh, I have in my mind is that we know that uh, we have to deal more and more with uh, younger people uh, with uh, quite large BMI. So if we can catch those guys at the uh, early stage of uh, the disease, I would say, uh, that might be interesting to look at the, ba the possibilities of the, the balloon in, in this very specific setup. But uh, I'm, I'm not a bariatric surgeon, uh, but uh, looking at the chronic uh, obese patient, I don't think that there is room for this sort of, uh, of treatment. That's my personal opinion. So why in Brazil? Uh, maybe we have one Brazilian with us, and uh, maybe you can comment on that. Uh, oh. Yeah? Okay. So thank you for uh, giving me the word. I know that in Brazil, really, people are very much into balloons. Um, the thing is, as Professor Dalemann stated, what happens is what I predict that is going to happen in the state is that now a lot of people are going to put the balloons, and there will be a lot of enthusiasm early on. But then, uh, with time, people say, yeah, you know, it's not so good. You know, people vomit a lot. You know, the results in the long run are not so good. And there may be a kind of a decline. Uh, and I think this is what even is, is going on in Brazil. There's, when people say it's possible to put a balloon, it almost seems too good to be true. That's something that you can place endoscopically. Uh, almost zero mortality. You can lose weight. But then with times and with the complications that come and with the results in the long run that are not so good, uh, people sometimes they lose a little bit of enthusiasm. Uh, what I think happens still in Brazil is that uh, we're still in the middle of the curve. So still a lot of people are trying the balloon, and, uh, but the older surgeons, uh, for example, if you know Professor Marquezini from Curitiba, is a well-known bariatric surgeon. He's already giving up the balloons because I think he did so much, and in the end, you see that the results are not so good. So as far as the concept is very interesting uh, in the long run. I, I wonder also, uh, looking at these curves, if there is no question about marketing. I mean, for a guy who is uh, uh, pro proposing balloons to his patient, I mean, it's a very, very nice. I mean, you have no surgery, and uh, you will lose weight uh, within the coming days, etc. So in terms of marketing, it's excellent. And uh, so you have the patient, and then you know that probably it won't work. So the guy will come back to you and say, it doesn't work. We need something else. And you understand what, what is the else. So that's in terms of marketing for a bariatric surgeon, it's excellent. So at least, you know, bringing people into the bariatric market. Is that what you're saying? Great. Okay. Well, great. Listen, we're going to come back to you guys in just a minute because we know Europe has lots of uh, experience. But I do want to just briefly hear from our other international site in Canada. Can we go just quickly to um, Dalhousie in Nova Scotia? And I'm not sure if the Canadians are using the balloon or not, but maybe we can hear from these guys. Hi, Phil. Hey, how you doing? Uh, Jim Elsner here. Um, the the uh, bioenteric uh, balloon has been uh, approved by Health Canada for you know, the last decade, um, and uh, it's interesting as a as a community of uh, bariatric surgeons in in Canada, we never talk about it. Uh, in my own practice here on the East Coast, I've actually never came across one, um, and so. Um, so there, there, there were a few cosmetic clinics uh, uh, in, the, in the 
um, in Ontario, I think, that were placing them. But I, I, my sense is the volumes were quite low because, uh, I, again, uh, we just don't even talk about any of the complications at, at any of the uh, national meetings. Uh, so, uh, so it's, um, it, it hasn't, uh, despite the fact that it's been health, approved by Health Canada, it's not publicly funded. And so it would all be through the, the private arm. It just hasn't had a lot of market penetration. And again, we haven't seen many complications. So it's, uh, it's I, I, aside from that, I, I can't comment on that much. Thanks, Jim. So it sounds like in Canada, a very low um, impact in 10 years. So great. Well, John, let's hear about some of the data. There's been a number of studies coming out recently, and please share with us some of this new information. Sure. I'm, I'm going to show the technique here a little bit uh, first. So the, the technique for placement is, is very simple, and, and I just want to make a comment about what we were just talking about. And I, I think one of the big things that we're going to see, in, in my opinion, is that this is really bringing the gastroenterology community into the bariatric world. And I think it's a very different perspective for us as surgeons, where you can sit with your patient, you know what the data is for every option out there, whether it's surgery, whether it's an endoscopic therapy, and you can offer what you think it's best. But I think for the gastroenterologists that are interested in some of these procedures, I think this is where their scope ends. So if they can't do this, they're referring patients to you know, a, a surgeon, and, and they're basically losing their, their role in the game. So in, the technique is very simple. It's, it, it's done with an EGD, uh, plus minus the use of a wire, depending on, on the, whether you're using the Orbear or the reshaped duo. It can be done under sedation, and the balloons are filled with either just plain saline or saline with methylene blue. And this is just quick, a uh, two minute video on the reshape uh, duo balloon. Uh, <clears throat> so, diagnostic endoscopy looking for ulcers or any sort of abnormality, a wire is passed into the duodenum. Uh, there's no recommendation in terms of use of fluoroscopy. Uh, the balloon with the delivery device is advanced over the wire into the stomach and under endoscopic view. Um, the goal is to place the distal balloon at the incisura or just before the incisura. Um, here you can see how the proximal balloon is insufflated first. These are connected to a, a bag of saline and methylene blue from the outside and, and some people like to use a pump. Um, and then the distal balloon is inflated, as you can see here in the video. Um, the valves are sealed with a, a valve sealant that comes in the kit and then the, uh, the delivery device is, is unplugged and the balloon placement is reviewed with final endoscopy. Now for deflation and removal, very very similar procedure, a diagnostic endoscopy, then a uh, puncture catheter is used to puncture through the balloon, um, and the same catheter is inserted uh, to the second depth mark, and the balloons are drained externally. So <coughs> the, the placement process takes uh, According to the biggest trial, about nine minutes. The removal process is a little bit more, uh, a little bit slower. It takes about 15 minutes or so, but still, I mean, pretty quick procedure. And then the uh, rat tooth grasper is used to kind of puncture the balloon uh, before removal. Uh, you have to snare the, the the proximal cup, and then pull the entire system with the endoscope into the. Uh, into the esophagus and, and try to do this under direct vision. For the uh, Orbera balloon, uh, very similar. They don't recommend the use of a wire. Um, again, the delivery system is inserted into the esophagus uh, with or without the scope. <coughs> the balloon is insufflated <coughs> under direct vision. And uh, again, the, uh, the same delivery device is uh, un uh, disconnected and, and uh, and the balloon stays in place. So for the removal of the Orbera, again, uh, you can use a, a needle catheter and a double hook. <clears throat> the balloon is desufflated and then it's, it's pulled out the esophagus here. So here comes the big question. <coughs> I'm sorry. So does it work? And I'm gonna, there's a lot of data out there. Most of it are small uh, trials uh, from Europe, Asia, and I'm going to exclude a lot of those, and I'm going to focus more on the randomized trials that are out there. And uh, the first one I'm going to mention is the Orbera pivotal trial here in the U.S., which is a prospective randomized, non-blinded study 
uh, in patients with a BMI of between 30 and 40, uh, randomized to a treatment or control group in a one-to-one -one ratio. So there were, there were about 260 patients, uh, uh, kind of half and half. The treatment group had the Orbera balloon placed uh, with removal after six months, which is the FDA recommendation. Um, and they also participated in a 12-month behavioral modification program. Well, the control group only had a two-month uh, behavioral modification program. And for the, like I mentioned, patients in the treatment group, the device was removed, and uh, they still had to attend regular office visits uh, for a period of a year. And what they found is that at six months, the Urbera group achieved a mean excess weight loss of 38.4, which was uh, significantly higher than the uh, control group. Uh, and the toddy, uh, total body weight loss at six months was 10% for the treatment group compared to 3.3%. Um, so not only they lost uh, more weight than the control, they were also able to maintain it uh, through the whole uh, study period, which was a year. Now, the reduced pivotal trial, which was uh, also a prospective randomized controlled study, um, where they randomized patients to either balloon with uh, behavioral therapy and dieting versus uh, sham endoscopy uh, with the same intervention. So this was a very interesting study and I think in my opinion it's a, it's a better design study out there. So looking at their algorithm, uh, they randomized about 300 patients, uh, 187 treatment subjects, of those only 167 completed the uh, six month follow up versus 126 controls. The randomization period entered, uh, stopped after 24 weeks, and then at that time, the patients that did not have the balloon were offered uh, the balloon, and about 77 of those actually uh, went ahead and got the balloon, and they stayed in the in the study for about six more years. The the population was uh, very similar. Their mean BMI was 35. Um, very similar uh, comorbidities. Uh, so here are the results, and, and I think it's a, it's a very interesting um, data. Looking at the chart on the left, this was the intent to treat analysis of the 187 patients that had the balloon where they had uh, a percent weight loss or uh, excess weight loss of 25% versus 11.3, and it was actually a little bit higher on, their, on the completed cases. Now looking at some of the, of the, the, the benefits of the balloon therapy, the quality of life was higher in the balloon group, uh, same as physical function, uh, self-esteem, sexual life, and their work performance. In terms of the morbidity or, or complications, most of these patients did have some degree of nausea or pain uh, post-op, but it typically started to resolve after about three days of, of therapy. This is a, uh, a meta-analysis that was published uh, last year looking at about 11 randomized studies uh, between the United States, Europe, um, and Asia, and, and there's a, a, a big one from Europe. So most of these had a very small uh, sample size, and the intervention was very variable. Uh, some patients just had the balloon place, some patients did have some degree of behavioral modification or, or physical therapy. And the follow-up was uh, also very different. Uh, most of the studies were just two, three, or four months. Uh, there was only one study that followed these patients for, for a year, and that was out of Italy. And their results did show a tendency towards uh, better weight loss uh, in the, in the um, treatment group than in the, in, the, in the control groups. Now, interesting from this meta-analysis, uh, one, one of the observations from some of these studies um, especially the ones that followed their patients a little bit longer, is that actually patients lost more weight after the balloon was removed than when the balloon was uh, in place. So, so I think it leads us to the question, did the balloons really work or is it just how aggressive we're being with these patients and enrolling them in a weight loss program and, and having them commit to this, which is really what's, what's driving our, our, our results. And I think uh, Probably the only study out there that did a good job at answering this question is the pivotal uh, study uh, from the reshape duo. But I think every other study out there still leaves this question up in the air. Yeah. Great, John. Well, let's hear from some of our colleagues here. But again, bottom line with all these studies, what is the expected weight loss in terms of percent body weight loss or percent, you know, 
excess weight loss. So it's very variable, and, and the data shows about 20 to 40 percent, so a very uh, ample margin. I think it has to do a lot with the intervention that goes uh, into play. Um, I think for the for both of the studies that were done here, we're looking at about a 25 to 30 percent excess weight loss. At least in the short term. Six months. And there's very little long term. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Now, let's go to uh, London, Imperial College of London because I did not call on them, and I do want to hear, um, again, this international perspective. We heard that, uh, at least in the heart of Europe, France, not much activity there. In Brazil, um, some, but it seems to be not so um, too much growth. So how about in England? Can we hear from our friends in uh, Imperial College of London? Hello, hi. Um, our experience Can you identify at, yourself, please? So my name is uh, Chan Preet. We've got a group of uh, registrars here in the surgery and cancer department here at Imperial College. Great, welcome. Um, our, so what's happening our, in uh, the UK with balloons? Not much, to be honest. Um, there's a few there's a few centres that are involved in trials. Imperial College is one of them. One of the consultants here, who's not with us unfortunately today, um, is part of that trial. It's not widely available on the NHS. It is available through just trials and a few groups here and there, but our experience here is quite limited. Okay, so uh, apparently it's not really uh, taking off too much uh, in the UK. So that's that's important for us to, to know. Um, good. Well, let's go to um, our colleagues. Uh, let's go to uh, to uh, Maryland and Anne Arundel Medical Center. Mm -hmm. And my colleague, I think Alex Gonzis is there. And I see Adrian Park as well. So good morning, guys. Uh, Alex, so are you guys doing the balloon, or what do you think about it? Uh, good morning, Phil. Good morning, everyone. Um, we are now doing the balloon at this point. Uh, can, can you hear me? Yeah. So we are now doing the balloon at this point. However, we do identify a group of patients uh, with a very high BMI. We're talking about a BMI 70 and higher which um, many times fails uh, medical intervention to bring them to a much more friendly BMI from the surgical standpoint. And I think that uh, a balloon or that kind of uh, approach will be very beneficial for this particular group of patients to lose uh, at least 25, 30% of excess weight loss to make it more um, appealing for anesthesia and obviously for uh, ultimate surgery. Great. That's what I think for bariatric surgeons, that's kind of the area that seems to be most interesting to use it. Um, Dr. Rodriguez, you didn't show any data on that, um, you know, as a staging procedure. Do you have any comments? Uh, sure. So <coughs> it's, it's very interesting. So when I was doing my, my training for the Orbera balloon, you know, I was sitting in, in this conference room with a, a group of gastroenterologists and surgeons, and, and the, the Orbera training team wanted to ask around what the expectation was for the balloon and you know I think everybody kind of wanted to see what there was and, and there was two of us that work in, in, in academic uh, practices in that uh, audience and both of us had the same question which is you know what is the role for you know what we're looking for bridging therapy some higher risk patients uh, the transplant population I think it, it, it sounded very interesting to a lot of us but the reality is, is that it's not FDA approved for any of those indications. And that's why none of these randomized trials that you're, we're going to see are going to have that patient population because it is not FDA approved. Your BMI stops at 40. 40. And a lot of the medical comorbidities that we see in those patients uh, are also contraindications for the balloon. Yeah. So I think those are all big potential areas of research. But I don't think we're going to see any any big data coming out anytime soon. At That's a very good point, uh, John. So the current FDA approval is a very narrow window, isn't it? Absolutely. Three to 40. Absolutely. So now, surgeons can do, we all do some things off-label, you know. Um, we have the right to do that. But if you did this in a BMI of 50 or 60, it would be off-label, correct? Off-label would have to be an IRB uh, research uh, yeah. kind of yeah. situation. So, Alex, what do you think about that? Um, doing this off-label in a super morbidly obese patient, are you going to do that? Uh, certainly very appealing, as we have a very uh, significant amount of patients with a BMI higher than 65, 70. Uh, which made it very difficult for us to manage them, and there was a lot of frustration with this patient when I would ask him, well, you need to lose 50 or to 80 pounds before we can actually consider surgery for them. But definitely uh, uh, through an IRB and a good research protocol, yeah, we're, that's, that's, certainly we're very interested. Okay, great. 
Let's go, uh, I believe Professor Vicks at IRCAD in Strasbourg talked about this concept um, of using this as a staging. Is uh, Dr. Vicks still there or is he, has he left the building? <laughs> He has left a building, but um, I maybe can comment that. Uh, we, we do use uh, sometimes balloon as a staging procedure, as a staged procedure in patients who have uh, uh, very high BMIs. Although we, uh, being in Europe, I think we don't, we are not, we are luckier than you are. So usually our patients have uh, BMI between 45 and I would say 52. So for those patients, we would uh, uh, p consider surgery as the first uh, line of treatment. And then for higher BMI, or if also if the patient is not psychologically ready for surgery, we might consider to do a balloon trial before and then take the patient for surgery. Yeah. yeah. How about the consequences um, of doing a, a bariatric procedure after the balloon has been removed? I was in Kuwait last year, and they put lots of balloons in Kuwait in the in the Gulf area, and they were removing the balloon in this one woman. And I noticed that the gastric wall seemed to be very thickened. And I noticed that there seemed to be a, a, a mucosal reaction. And it just uh, concerned me that, um, you know, doing a gastric bypass on that stomach, you know, a week later might lead to some problems. So do you have any comments in that regard? Yeah, I mean, it's a foreign body. It st stays there for uh, for um, for six months minimum, and uh, it does it does produce a lot of inflammation and uh, thickening of the stomach. And uh, indeed, uh, it's our policy to wait uh, for one and a half two months before uh, taking the patient to the OR for surgery. And you have to be careful in this patient, even even at that time, because the the stomach can be still thickened because of uh, of the uh, presence of the balloon. So those are patients who uh, I, I, we are particularly care, uh, taking care uh, during, during surgery when we operate on them. And we might change also the kind of stapler that we're using when, uh, when stapling the stomach. And, um, but up to now, we didn't have a higher rate of uh, complication related to leaks or uh, failures of the stapler in this kind of patient. So you have to be careful, but I'm sure that there is, if you wait a couple of months before taking them to the, uh, to the operating room for a procedure, you can do the procedure safely. Great. I'm sorry, doctor. I did not catch your name. Can you tell us your name again? It's Silvana Perretta. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, now, in these super morbidly obese patients, doctor, what type of uh, weight loss are you seeing? Are you seeing 20, 30 kilogram weight loss? Because that's what we're trying to get in these super, super heavyweights. No, we, we haven't been so lucky. We're seeing around 10 to 15 kilos weight loss, no more than that. Even if uh, when we place a balloon, we also uh, uh, tell the patient that he or she has to follow behavioral advices and nutritional advices. So uh, we don't just put the balloon and leave them, leave them alone. But even with uh, behavioral uh, advices, they uh, don't lose more than that. Okay. Some of us would argue uh, that using a, uh, like a protein-sparing diet, an aggressive short-term diet, we get those kinds of weight loss and even better sometimes. So I do want to hear from other surgeons about that concept, balloon versus an aggressive short-term diet. Let's go back to the United States. I want to hear from, uh, let's go to Mount Sinai, uh, Beth Israel in New York, and I think Barry Nabnet is available. And hey, there you go, Barry. How you doing? Good. Good morning. Um, so Barry, I'd like to balloons, yeah. boom or bust? <laughs> well, I think the verdict's out. Um, I'd like to first congratulate Dr. Rodriguez on a, on a very concise presentation. Um, you know, it's interesting. We're struggling here in New York how to responsibly introduce this technology to our armamentarium. And it's begun with negotiating with a hospital to get a bundled payment. Um, it costs about $7,000. That's the, the kind of the going rate here in New York. And um, but the companies want you to buy in bulk, so you can't buy one and try it. You have to actually buy in bulk, so it requires a commitment from your institution on the front end um, to to develop a program. In addition, we're working to try to determine how to get the workflow into the bariatric program, where, for example, these patients, if they do go for ballooning uh, by gastroenterology, um, they would be seen by nutrition and go through the same pathway 
as we would for a, um, a bariatric surgery patient. And there are some real challenges there. And already we're starting to see um, advertisements on the subway, um, commercials on television, local commercials, et cetera, advertising uh, incisionless weight loss. Um, and I have great concerns about this because what's going to happen, there's 30 million people in this area um, and there's a gastroenterologist and or a bariatric surgeon on every corner. And I think that the, the, the train is out of the station with this. And if we aren't responsible in the way we collect data and analyze those data, then this could be a bust. So that's the struggles we're seeing here on, in the real world. I'd like to also um, introduce Dr. Benias. He's one of our interventional gastroenterologists who has experience with balloon placement. And Petrus, why don't you tell us your experience? Well, uh, good morning. So we haven't, we haven't yet started placing them here, and we're still working on that. Um, you know, I, I think the, the problem is that no matter how well the company tries to control the release of these balloons to specific uh, gastroenterologists with expertise, it's not going to be the case. I, I was driving in this morning, I saw a big billboard actually for balloon placement right by the Lincoln Tunnel. So obvious, obviously uh, it's way far gone. Um, and uh, our interest as an academic institution in using it for bridging I think is very is very reasonable, but I, you know the reality of that situation is I don't know how equipped we are to handle BMIs of 60 in the endoscopy suite, and it's not going to be so easy even doing a simple endoscopy on these patients when they reach those BMIs. Um, so I think what's going to happen, unfortunately, is that they will be used in the lower BMIs, and probably the excess weight loss will be very good, um, and it may even be used off label. Uh, in a cosmetic fashion. Uh, that's, I think that's what we're really worried about in New York, being that it is New York. And we're going to see that for sure. Yeah, now uh, these balloons were approved by the FDA just this past fall. So uh, I imagine, you know, centers are getting geared up. So in New York, um, are you already seeing, um, you know, a number of these being performed or is it still very much in the startup mode? Very much in the startup mode, but it's coming. And like, I wasn't aware of that billboard advertisement, but I have um, seen similar advertisements. So we know that there's going to be a, a, and I think our Brazilian colleague, the ERCOT Institute, has a very good um, vision of how it's going to play out here in the United States. There's going to be a, resurg a surgence of interest and a, a penetration of the marketplace. And then over time, as we start to see some of the outcomes and perhaps even some of the adverse outcomes, or the ineffectiveness in inappropriately placed balloon devices, then I think there'll be a, a loss of, uh, of interest. Um, it, it'll wane somewhat. But we're very interested in really developing a responsible collaborative program between GI and surgery where the patients are plugged into the proper pathway and we follow the data very carefully. But I know this; these data will be collected um, in the national registries that we all participate in as accredited institutions. However, I think the, the market share really is going to be greatly penetrated by the GI community and those patients are not going to be captured. It's going to be a different patient population and the data are not going to be captured in the National Registry. So it's really going to be like mixing apples and oranges when we try to assess the global outcome of balloon placement. So I have some real reservations about how this is being rolled out. Clearly this is going to be industry driven. It's a product and um, I think there is a little bit of conflict of interest there as well. Yeah, and I, and I think uh, what a lot of surgeons, uh, gastroenterologists as well, are concerned about are these rare complications, particularly that were reported in the 80s and 90s. And I'm so glad we have a gastroenterologist here to comment. So could you comment on uh, these issues of uh, bowel obstruction, where the balloon um, you know, bursts and passes down the GI tract and causes a bowel obstruction? Or could you comment on some of the local stomach reaction, you know, gastritis, uh, GERD, could you make some comments on the, the relative rate of these uh, types of complications, both like you hear from Barry as well as our gastroenterologist? I mean, I think maybe you might have Dr. Carlock may have more experience. With the oh, Dr. 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 Carlock snuck in behind me. He's our chief of gastroenterology. I didn't see him. Good morning, David. Good morning. Can you hear me Good okay? Uh, so, I mean, GI has had experience with all types of balloons over many years, and of course the record has been terrible, which is why we, we have a, a black cloud over the whole uh, phenomenon. Uh, the, these types of balloons that are available worldwide now are very different. 
from the old type that were uh, withdrawn. Uh, at previously, we saw some terrible complications, mainly to do with the design of the balloon, which I think they, those have passed. We've, we don't have those anymore. So the ones we're seeing now and are likely to see many of, because I'm sure there will be indiscriminate use of these balloons as, as we've been flying here, um, we will start to see bad reflux. We'll start to see local complications in the stomach. Those patients will come to us from the community. They will not be dealt with uh, out in the real world, and that's, of course, ex we, what we expect to see. Uh, bowel obstruction, of course, has been reported already with uh, many different types of balloons worldwide. We're going to see it, for sure. It's going to be rare, hopefully, uh, because of the design of the balloon being uh, well-maintained in its uh, inflation mode. Uh, but we expect to see all of this, and uh, we're just waiting for the, the deluge as these balloons get placed. Uh, you know, if there are billboards uh, next to the Lincoln Tunnel, then there are thousands of patients going to be taking them. Um, so I think uh, we're, we're prepared for it, but I think much more important is how we deal with our own patients through the same pathway that uh, bariatric surgeons have been using for a while. And I think the community gastroenterologists have no clue about this. They think this is going to be an easy procedure. We've already heard from your presenter that the technique is simple, which it is. Uh, but that's just the beginning and a part of the story. And if those patients are not handled well uh, in the way that they should, we're going to see more and more complications. Great. Well, I really appreciate your perspective on this. Um, and, and we heard from some of our colleagues in Europe um, uh, as well, and, it, and they've had this, these balloons for a decade or so, the same, virtually the same balloons, and there's not been a deluge. So do you think it's going to be a different reaction out of the States because of just our free market uh, society or, or, or not? I, I think it is very different here. You know, the whole marketing machine is different. Uh, we're starting to see that already. I have to say the companies have been very responsible about how they've introduced the, the, uh, the technology to us and to the public. I, I don't think the companies are, are pushing this uh, on the public. They're, they're pushing it to us, of course, to get trained uh, and to be responsible and understand how they work, and that's fine. But in the real world, that's not what happens. Uh, if you think of anything that has remotely anything to do with cosmetics, uh, you're going to see uh, an enormous marketing ploy by many centers. And I think gastroenterologists in particular have never dealt with the, the bariatric patient, just don't know what they're doing. And we've seen this before with other things that not quite the same, but um, uh, techniques that look simple but require a whole um, setup around them uh, to make sure that the patient is handled correctly and done, and the procedures are done safely. Well, I think that I think that's I think that's uh, part of the problem here is that um, the free market in uh, private endoscopy units in the city is huge, but none of these places are really equipped to handle these BMIs or, or to deal with complications or even a complex removal. Uh, so I, I think that they may be in over their heads when they really start targeting the real uh, class of patients they should be. So we'll see. Well, I would appreciate having two gastroenterologists uh, this morning. Barry, thank you for bringing these gentlemen. I do want to take advantage of this opportunity. Uh, uh, gastroenterologists outnumber bariatric surgeons probably 10 to 1, so it's conceivable that most of these will be done by gastroenterologists. So could you guys speak about uh, what, you, what is appropriate credentialing, what type of experience, endoscopic experience, should the, uh, the, the interventionists have? And also, if gastroenterologists are going to do this, um, should this be in collaboration with a, a comprehensive bariatric center, or is it appropriate to just do these uh, as a one-off type of treatment? I can tell you what we're doing here is um, developing an integrated uh, program with GI and surgery um, in that we're going to be building a new hospital in the next um, four years, which will have uh, some hybrid um, endoscopy suites and, and other hybrid rooms as well. Um, with fixed imaging and whatnot, and um, that gives us the opportunity to put this program in place. And there, there lies one of the, the the challenges is credentialing. So we have surgeons that are in our department that are doing this in conjunction with GI, working together in the endoscopy suite. And we have to at present um, somewhat antiquated. They have to be double credentialed in medicine uh, and in surgery. There's no DOP for just doing endoscopy. Uh, but I think that's what we're working on here to have an integrated program. So when we do porn procedures and other advanced endoscopic techniques, that surgery and GI are working hand in hand so that surgeons and 
gastroenterologists will be uh, performing these procedures with appropriate backup on either side of the equation. Um, that's, um, there are some challenges with that, though, and some big personalities involved and some politics, but so far, so good. We've, um, we're moving forward with that, with that vision. Yeah. Uh, in addition to just a standard uh, weekend course, uh, are you guys requiring any other type of special training for these balloon insertions and removals? Well, so far, it, there has been um, a pretty good publication from one of our national societies, the uh, ASGE, defining what's required for a gastroenterologist to be uh, credentialed for this. And, uh, of course, there has to be a background of uh, endoscopic expertise. Uh, training courses um, are mainly being uh, controlled by, the, uh, by industry, which is uh, predictable. I think eventually the, the, uh, our profession will take that over, and that's usually what happens as experience grows. Uh, we have an excellent training center in Chicago that uh, can train a large number of uh, physicians at the same time and over time, so I think that will, that will automatically happen. Um, in terms of precise numbers, I don't think that's been defined yet. Uh, sort of in, in a way, it's a shame that the technique of placement is so simple. Uh, if it were more complicated, we'd have more control over it. But uh, it is simple, and I think uh, people, people learn how to do this very quickly. Uh, so it has to be in the right circumstances. The, the physician has to be credentialed in an appropriate setting for, for other endoscopic procedures to maintain skills. Uh, but the actual training is, is uh, pretty basic. All right, so my understanding, it's uh, basically two steps. Uh, you have to have endoscopy privileges, and then you have to do yes. the weekend course, and then you can go out and do these in patients. There's no proctoring required. I mean, John, is that your understanding too? Because you took the course. Yeah, no, there's no proctoring required. I, and I think what the, what, what the, the enterprises are doing, is they're targeting, you know, people who are either uh, bariatric surgeons with some sort of endoscopy practice or, or, or GI, um, you know, gastroenterologists with, the, with busy endoscopy practice that are interested in doing it. And, and honestly, you know, the technique is very simple. It, it, I don't think it requires a lot, of, um, a lot of additional things to what we already do. You know, passing the introducer is very similar to passing a bougie and using the end scope. So it's a very simple technique. But I think, um, <clears throat> you know, the big question is going to be the responsibility of, of doing this, you know, putting our patients first and, and putting aside the, the the potential economic implications of it because it is very attractive, I think, for both surgeons and gastroenterologists out there in, in, in smaller community practice to be doing something that's paid out of pocket by the patient. Right. Well, we're almost ready to finish here, but I do want to get one last question. This, this is a burning question I have, that these balloons are supposed to come out in six months. So, gentlemen, there are going to be patients that say, no, doctor, I'm losing weight. I want to keep the balloon in longer. So that can bring up all kinds of legal implications if a patient keeps that balloon in longer. And so could you gentlemen speak to that issue? How are you going to manage that issue? And what responsibility does the, the endoscopist, the surgeon, the, the bariatric center have in contacting these patients? After all, thousands will be done and making sure that they know that balloon needs to come out at six months and what are you going to do when you see these balloons in for nine months, years? Uh, well, Phil, I think if, if those are the accepted guidelines, then when we see a patient with a balloon beyond six months, the recommendation is to remove it and I think we're going to see Patients will be able to work around this. There'll be medical tourism, I predict, um, where patients will go elsewhere, have a balloon placed, and then we're going to you know, be perhaps seeing these patients in follow-up um, years after a balloon's been placed. Um, but I think we have to hold true to the recommendations. The recommendation is to remove it six months. I don't know. I'll, there's no way around that, really, until those recommendations are changed or data supports um, a different, a different uh, option. So does your center plan on keeping, you know, a list of your patients and are you going to have your staff track, you know, who's out at six months and because some of these folks are not going to necessarily voluntarily come in to have their balloon removed. So it's absolutely. Upon yeah, we will we will track these patients very carefully and um, we are still in a dialogue, but perhaps, um, you know, our, our bariatric registry would be the place 
um, and the MBSAQIP registry to follow these patients because we'd like to plug them into the bariatric pathway just like uh, uh, considering this another option for patients. But um, again, it's a cash paying option. So I don't think there's gonna be, um, some of our patients even struggle with the copay for seeing our nutritionist. So um, to ask them to pay $7,000 for a balloon, it's gonna be largely patient driven, uh, but we will have some patients for sure that come into the program requesting this device. Okay, very good. Well, lots of challenges ahead. I believe our time is almost up. Um, John, do you want to just sort of summarize? Do you have a, I mean, a summary slide or summary statement? Uh, sure. So, you know, I, just, I, I was going to go over the safety, but overall, you know, very safe uh, thing. So I think the big question out there, at least for me uh, in an academic practice, is what's going to be the future directions of this? Because I, I, what I got from, from all of our participants is that I don't think any of us are really strong believers in this, but I think we all see a, a potential and I think we're all thinking outside the box in terms of what the implications are going to be, whether it's going to be for early intervention of patients who are low BMI but with a high uh, comorbidity risk. You know, there's a lot of patients that have a high risk for diabetes. Is this something that would be uh, investigational application? Uh, a good bridge therapy for patients who are, you know, super obese or have a high risk medical profile. So, you know, I think in summary, the only things we can say is that the balloon is an option as an endoscopic bariatric therapy, but we have to be very careful in how we apply this option. Um, it is safe and, and, and feasible, but I think the role and the results are, are a little bit unclear, at least in the, in the medical community. Um, but the potential applications outside of what I think the current FDA uh, recombinations are seem very promising. 